So I'm going to jump right in and go to Kate's discussion of the second volume of The Second Sex, which is called Lived Experience, in which you write, de Beauvoir reverses the philosophical perspective on power, instead of analyzing women from the point of view of those who dominated, she turned to the everyday life of those who were expected to submit. To do this, she discussed topics that the philosophical elite did not consider worthy at the time. How household work was divided, how women experienced sexual initiation and practices. These were not elevated questions you write about the nature of reality or the possibility of knowledge. Rather, they were questions about who gets to say what parts of reality matter and whose knowledge is worthy of the name. Can you tell us about this move that de Beauvoir makes to examine the kind of everyday experience of women and how radical was that at the time? Okay, uh, well, thank you. I, there's a lot that could be said about this and I look forward to uh, hearing what Manon has to say as well. Um, I think the to talk about what is happening in the second volume of the second text, I need to say a little bit about what is happening in the first. Um, in particular, that in the volume that she calls uh, facts and myths. She presents these so-called facts and myths about women as they have been defined by men. And the way I understand what is happening in the second volume is in part that she is trying to juxtapose that position and say, well, if you let's look at the experience of the experiences of women who live under a multiplicity of incompatible, incompatible myths. And uh, to see how this results in uh, feelings of what she calls split subjectivity, feeling torn, uh, feeling that one fails in a certain respect to be a woman uh, because you can only incarnate one myth at a time. And after all, you're only human. Uh, so I, th I think um, the, the, the move was revolutionary. I think one of the things that's, that's also uh, really distinctive about this is that she doesn't write in a single voice. Uh, she she draws a lot on women's testimonies of their own lives. She draws on literary examples because she's not trying to say there's one thing it means to be a woman and this is it, uh, but rather that there's variation in the experiences of being woman in the context of a multiplicity of incompatible myths. Um, so I'll leave it at there uh, for now. I just want to ask you one more question and then we'll go to Manon. We, I mentioned sex, I mentioned labor. Are there any other examples that she draws on that were surprising to you, that have been surprising to other people or that might speak to us kind of in this theme of contemporary feminism? Examples of from drawn from everyday experience. Yes, so I think one of the ones that interests me most is her description of motherhood and the way that um, motherhood is often incredibly ambivalent. Uh, and she's in, in interested in the, the chapter on motherhood uh, uh, in two myths in particular, the idea that motherhood is always enough to fulfill a woman um, and that children will ha find happiness in their mother's arms. Um, she says if, if, if a woman is a mutilated human being, um, then it's going to be difficult for people to, for, for children to get the kind of care they need as human beings. Um, and under the, the patriarchy that she saw in her own society, uh, she thought that many people's experiences were experiences of mutilation. And this is something that I care about quite a lot because one of the leading, in fact, the leading cause of maternal mortality uh, in the year after childbirth in this country, the United States and Britain is suicide. And that is not something that is widely discussed, as at least not as widely as I think it should be. Thank you. Let's go to Manon. At the start of your book, On ne n'est pas si mise en le devient, about female submission, you write, and this is very much in the spirit of de Beauvoir, that the experience and reality of female submission is much more general and everyday than it is usually presented. It is neither in the minority nor exceptional. Can you tell us about your analysis of this submission? How is it expressed, experienced, and explained? <laughs> I spent only 10 years of my life working on this, so let's try to summarize uh, 10 years in two minutes. <laughs> no, um, so I was thinking about this today. I think um, when we chose uh, the title in French, we used the, the, the Beauvoir sentence, on ne n'est pas femme, on le devient, to say, on ne n'est pas soumise, on le devient. And, but when we 
um, chose the English title, we decided to use We Are Not Born Submissive. And I think it was actually, in a way, it was it was a betrayal of the, the Bovarian sentence, but you know how American publishers um, always think that the, their audience is illiterate, so they think, oh, no one understands, no one has ever heard of Beauvoir, so we can like skip the reference. But I like the fact that it was very clear from the title that I thought all women were concerned and that I was one of them. Because um, in the French title, it, it, like it, it happened again recently that someone told me, oh yeah, I saw the title of your book, before knowing you, and I thought, oh, like that's a, a terrible anti-feminist who's just blaming women for their submission. And so when it became a first uh, person plural, it was very clear that I was including myself in it and that my question was more how we can think about women's role in the perpetuation of patriarchy and of a social order that was unfair. And it's true that, um, so I started working on this in a way before becoming a Beauvoirian, and I became a Beauvoirian a bit accidentally, that someone asked me to comment on this book by Nancy Bauer, and I read it and I was like, oh wow, that's really unfortunate. It looks like the second sex that I tried reading a long time ago is doing exactly what I was hoping to do, but better. Um, and so I read The Second Sex, and I probably had my prism of my uh, of my topic in, in mind, but it's true that it was solving so many problems of understanding how women's submission to men works, and, and how, like, how to solve the problem of are women responsible, are they guilty, why is it that we feel like they're part of this, so they're, they're choosing to some extent, but at the same time, their choice is not like choosing between tea and coffee. It's not like they have the choice between freedom and submission and they're like, oh yeah, let's submit and let's not be free. And because that's the way women have been portrayed and women's submission has been portrayed as women voluntarily giving up on their freedom when they would have another choice that would have the same cost and benefit. And so I really thought that the existentialist framework and in the way and Beauvoir's uh, theory of oppression was really helping me un respond to my question of what is submission and, and what are women doing. So it was very exciting. So the framework is Beauvoirian, but then of course you're writing in the 21st century. So can you tell us if it's an everyday, you know, not in the minority thing, how is it expressed? How is it experienced in a 21st century contemporary so that context? Was, that was actually funny because I reread The Second Sex for like a the fourth time or something like that, right after the beginning of the Weinstein scandal. And there's this passage in the in the second volume where Beauvoir talks about actresses who think that they have power because they work out and they're skinny and they're sexy and they're and there is this sentence which says, but no matter how powerful actresses think they are, at the end of the day they're only objects in the hands of the Hollywood producer. And in 2017, reading this was crazy, you know, because we thought, oh yeah, like all these super actresses who have so much money and so much power. And and I feel like reading The Second Sex is like that. And that's my experience with my students. It, it happened against, uh, again to, uh, to me this semester. I had students from really all over the world and they all said, the, all the female students, they said something like, I felt like she read my diary and she wrote my diary down. And this is so powerful. And, and this is really, the thing with the second sex is that no matter how the world changes, et cetera, there's still some truth to be found for each of us in it. And, and I find it mind blowing, honestly. And, and one more question for you. This truth about submission you write goes against our preconceived notions about what submission might look like. Can you tell us in your book, you discuss briefly kind of what we think submission might be. Yeah, so of course, uh, some of you here may be familiar with French institutional <laughs> racism. Um, sorry. Um, no, but it, it was very interesting for me when I did my PhD in France on women's submission because people always told me, oh, you work on Muslim women. And it was, in the, it was self-evident for everyone that women's submission meant women who wear the veil. 
And and I I started being in those dinners with those like super skinny French women who tell you every time you have dinner with them that they just happen to have had an enormous goûter, so they really are not going to eat anything, and they're just having a glass of wine and and being super skinny and super sexy, etc., and having thousands of dollars worth of clothes on them and they're like oh these muslim women they're so submissive and um and so for me it was also a political act to say it's a problem that with submission we're we're saying oh this is the problem of the others this is the problem of the traditional women oh this is the problem of the american women you know they stay at home to take care of their kids while we French women, you know, we do the double day or the triple day. So it's so much better than staying at home, you know, like you can work the whole day and then you need to be sexy and then you need to cook so much better, so much more free. So that that's why it was important. That's why I was saying that it was important for me, this first person plural is because I, I wanted to counter this sort of racist, classist impulse that was also a sexist impulse because the uh, accusing women of being submissive was al always a way to say they were less than men, et cetera. So yeah, that's that was a political thing for me. Also, you deliberately, I really liked this, you, you say that you used de Beauvoir for two reasons. One, as you say, for this kind of analytical framework, and two, because you write, you wanted to convince French readers that de Beauvoir was a philosopher in her own right. And you say that what's remarkable uh, she's recognized all over the world. This is my translation, so just please know that. Recognized all over the world. She's discussed and studied everywhere except in France, where she generally seen as either Sartre's austere companion or as a sometimes successful author. Yeah, and so, a sort of a quaint relic of feminism. And and for me, it was crazy, you know, because I was born and raised in France, and suddenly I started wanted to work on Beauvoir and it became clear the only way to do that was to move to the US. And and you know, like the the patronizing professors at, at the Sorbonne who would tell me, but why work on Beauvoir? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting to read the second sex, but you read it, you understand it, like what is there to say about it? Like this is not philosophy. And so I thought Okay, like if I come back to France and I say, okay, I'm gonna write a book called Simone de Beauvoir as a Philosopher, the only people who are gonna pick up this book are people who are already convinced that she's interesting. And because there was the the, um, the Weinstein scandal, and because in France, honestly, so much has been done institutionally to prevent feminist philosophy from existing, when the 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 me too movement happened they had no one like the the newspapers etc they didn't know who to ask so there's a, a journalist from liberation who called me who said well i typed feminism and philosophy in the thèse.fr and it looks like you're doing something interesting could you do an interview with me which i did and and she said well it looks like you're saying interesting things can you send me your your phd thesis and I sent it to her and she said, how about you publish this like right now? And she introduced me to my wonderful publisher, Maxime Catrou, who's here. And, um, and, and it became clear that I could do the opposite of writing a book called Simone de Beauvoir Philosopher, which was writing a book kind of interesting for the Me Too movement, but through which I would prove that Beauvoir is a philosopher by philosophizing with her instead of exposing her views. And so it was a move to say, well, look, why do we think Kant is a philosopher? It's because we can do philosophy with Kant. Why do we think Hegel is a philosopher? It's because we do philosophy with Hegel. And so for me, it was important to show that we could do philosophy with Beauvoir. And very immodestly, I think this had a a good impact because a year later, Beauvoir entered the list of the philosophers, um, like the official list of philosophers for uh, high school students. And and I think it's because I, I just hammered <laughs> my view that she was a philosopher absolutely everywhere. And she was recognized as a, a writer, thanks to a lot of French people working on, on her literary contributions. But as a philosopher, it was still not happening. And now 
I found out that there's a student who did this seminar on the second sex uh, at the ONS. Like it's it's spreading, you know, like the word <laughs> is spreading. They have to recognize that she's a philosopher. And so now I, I may actually write a book called Simone de Beauvoir Philosopher because now there are people who are going to read it because the work has been done to convince them that this was not an absurd oxymoron or something like that. Yeah, I want to go to you for this, Kate, because this is a real through line throughout your book, basically explaining how this happened. Maybe you can fill in the picture a little bit about what Manon just said. Do you mean why she was seen as not a philosopher? Okay, well, that's, I mean, this is going to take us into speculative terrain. Uh, but I want to start by asking a, a, a metaphilosophical question about what philosophy is. So you, in the passage that you read out, um, I said that she wasn't talking about elevated questions of knowledge or reality, so that like the traditional core subjects of philosophy um, being epistemology and metaphysics. Um, and you still get hierarchies within philosophical communities of what counts as philosophy, or what's the best philosophy. Um, and Beauvoir herself had strong views about what was the best philosophy. Uh, she was not interested in systems. She wasn't interested in grand metaphysical pretensions uh, like she saw in people like Spinoza or Leibniz or Hegel or even I would say Sartre in certain uh, certain periods of his thought. Um, she was she called herself I think more of a subjectivity philosopher and in that category she put people like Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky interestingly um, because his polyphonic novels these novels with really rich uh, juxtapositions of points of view can present you with um, a kind of uh, experience of questioning yourself through the experience of the questioning of the characters that you're that you're following um so i think in terms of why Beauvoir was excluded from the the the, the category philosophy here i mean i'm tempted to say that it's it's largely sexism <laughs> Uh, I think it's also because people don't want to hear the message of the second sex, which is that the myths of uh, the, the multiplicity of myths about women perpetuate suffering and hierarchy, uh, sexual hierarchy, which she says in the introduction of the second sex, is evil. She's not afraid to come out and to judge it um, in, in very strong terms. And uh, nobody wants to be called evil. <laughs> especially not when it concerns things like your intimate relationships, your desires, and the, the, the things that tend to be uh, given a great deal of importance in life. Um, so I think that sexism is part of it. I think that it's, um, it's also discomfort about the subject matter. I mean, she, she does talk about things, that, you know, in 1949 that are incredibly taboo. Um, and so there, there, we could find more plausible explanations. Uh, but the thing that I would like to return to is Menon's point about her students, because many people say to me, well, why do you work on the, the second sex? You know, why isn't Beauvoir a white feminist? Isn't like this is second wave? Like, you know, this is surely we've moved beyond all this. Um, but my own students come to me finding things in the text that speak to them about their experiences. And these are students from many global contexts um, who find in her someone to think with. And they find in reading her a legitimation of their questions as worthy of reflection. And I think that's incredibly important. Thank you. I wanted to, just to go back to what you were first saying, I wanted to cite just one example in your book of where she's totally just knocked down from the pedestal of, of philosophers. So this is in 1946, Time magazine ran an article about Sartre, about the literary lion of Paris, describing being and nothingness as the Bible of existentialism and Beauvoir as its foremost um, disciple. Well, I don't know if you know about this. I suspect that there was also, you know, being in nothingness when it was published weighed exactly one kilo. And it was in 1943. And it was a time where there were no weights to weigh things and it was during the war. And so there was a whole thing about uh, being in, in nothingness being very useful to weigh things because it was li like on scales it was it was very useful but but this is this is a joke but I think it's also interesting about why people had the book and and honestly you know I I, uh, I taught it this year and it's an incredibly difficult book so sometimes I'm just like where did this fame come from? Because certainly very few people read it 
like cover to cover. She's one of them. I'm not one of them. And and I mean, it's it's a very difficult book. Um, but I think, I mean, Kate has wonderfully documented and analyzed this, but there was also, Beauvoir also played a role in pretending to be his disciple. And, and this is something we could talk about for a very long time. But another element that I think may be worth mentioning is the conception that the French have of what is a philosopher. And first of all, it can't be a woman um, because ex like except Anna Arendt, but I, every time French people talk about how Hannah Arendt was a philosopher is to talk about how anti-feminist she was. Um, and it feels like it's, it, it makes it okay. Um, but there is this idea of the genius, you know? And sur surprisingly, the geniuses can never be women. And so I, I feel like this was part of the thing that Sartre could be a crazy genius and Levinas and Merleau-Ponty and all these guys could be geniuses, but there was no place for her to be a genius. And for me, it's not anecdotal that it's Americans that started reading her and taking her seriously because analytic philosophy, so the way philosophy has been done traditionally in, in the US has many problems but it doesn't exactly have this genius cult. And it has this idea that philosophy is built together. And so that makes the idea that it's someone who has one idea out of nowhere that has nothing to do with the people they talk to less plausible and less important. And so there was place, there was space for her to be recognized without meaning that she would have to be a genius, she would have to be special. It just, we, we built philosophy as a collective endeavor. But Do you like to respond? I would like to, yes, because um, not everyone knows that in the first volume of The Second Sex, one finds the sentence, one is not born, but becomes a genius. And Beauvoir was very interested in, in philosophical definitions of genius. And there's a wonderful book by Christine Battersby called Genius and Gender or Gender and Genius. I can't remember which way around it is. Um, where she charts the, the the development of conceptions of genius in Rousseau and in Kant and in philosophers after Kant. And what's fascinating about them is that um, whatever, however genius is defined, uh, women cannot be geniuses. So a male genius, a male artistic genius, for example, has very feminine qualities, is, is emotional um, and sensitive, but in a male body, according to this um, according to the, th the thinking of the period. Um, women, of course, can't, can't be geniuses. However, it is, so it's fascinating. She, she chronicles each definition and the ways that women are systematically excluded from the category. And I think this is a really important aspect of the second sex because if you look at sexism, um, people often discuss production and reproduction. But Beauvoir is also interested in uh, creation and procreation, because one of the old myths about women is that all of their creative energy goes into offspring, into the, the generation and raising of offspring. Um, but Beauvoir's point when she talks about genius and says that one is not born, but rather becomes a genius, is that until this point, their becoming has rendered genius impossible. Um, so it's a really interesting, a, a really interesting thread that I think uh, is, you know, as we're saying, good to think with. Good. I want to move, we've talked a lot about kind of the content, the non-obvious ways she's doing philosophy about motherhood, about sex, about labor. I want to talk about form because you mentioned Dostoevsky. I'm really interested in de Beauvoir writing in literature and how her philosophy found its way into literature. So in the book, she was a great reader. Uh, there's this amazing passage that I kind of like took a screenshot of today. I think during the Second World War, you just listed everything that she read. And I was thinking, I so, I so want to try and do this one day when I'm, then you know, the next pandemic. This is something I'm going to read. Um, and so in the book, you cite her essay, Literature and Metaphysics. And I love this because I think it, it kind of expresses the tension that she's trying to reconcile in her mind about her love for literature and also her philosophical love. She writes, to open a novel was truly to enter a world, a concrete temporal world, peopled with singular characters and events. By contrast, a philosophical treatise would carry me beyond the terrestrial appearances into the serenity 
um, of a timeless heaven. Where was truth to be found, she asked, on earth or in eternity? I felt torn apart. Do, what do you think about Beauvoir's literary projects? Do you find them philosophical? Do you think they liberate philosophy from the bounds of, of the philosophical treatise? I find them philosophical, yes. Um, but I think the authority with which we can use them to attribute views to Beauvoir is a trickier question. Um, because when she, when she writes about things like Les, Mandar Les Mandarins, um, a lot of people thought that she was describing autobiographical experiences and that her experiences were all in the character of Anne. Um, but she's, she says in interviews that she put herself as much into other characters as she did into that one. And so I sometimes, I, I, I think there's this tendency to want to, to kind of use them as keys to use the literature as keys to Beauvoir's life, which I which I want to resist, except insofar as to say that I think you can use a novel um, to show the kind of dialectical process of questioning yourself. Uh, if you're going back and forth between points of view, if you're not sure what to think about something, um, I, I think that, that, that there can be this kind of this kind of technique at play. Um, so I, I'm happy to say that the novels are philosophical works, uh, but then as a as a scholar, I have questions about method in, in terms of where we go with, with that kind of claim. Yeah, I suppose the question is, what form can philosophy take? So, so here's yeah. literature. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, thank you. So, this is an old question. I mean, Plato and Aristotle give us different answers to it, um, and ever since, there's been quite a lot of argument about whether uh, poetry can be trusted to take us anywhere near the truth. Um, and I think the you know, when we read Plato's dialogues, we're reading a literary form. When we read Rousseau's confessions, when we read Augustine's confessions, um, there's so many texts in the history of philosophy that are uh, that are not treatises uh, or, you know, deductive proofs. Um, and that's legitimate in the case of many of these male authors. But in the case of Beauvoir, um, I think that it has been delegitimated. And, and, and this goes back to the point about gender and genius. So this kind of writing, the novel actually as a philosophical form uh, has been derided in the, in the tradition of post-Kantian philosophy. Uh, Kant thought it was effeminate uh, to read novels. And the, it's, so I think it plays into the ways that uh, cer certain forms have been uh, subject to discrimination. And I think one thing we don't, talk about enough about Beauvoir is that she's a philosopher of time and time is a very important question for her also because of her temperament um, <laughs> one could say and and that her temperament was that she was very worried about death and that she was very worried about capturing the present but and and so I think it's interesting to look at her novels as part of a bigger project of how do we capture life and and life in its thickness she was she was really a bergsonian and she she thought there was something about duration that was extremely hard to capture that she thought it was really a, a, a failure of philosophy to be unable with the treaties and the systems to capture the sort of intensity of life and this, you know, all these electrical metaphors that arrive at the end of the 19th century in French philosophy. And, and so I think that her diaries, her novels, her um, uh, travel diaries are as many attempts to look at life from a certain perspective and look at and, and try to grab time from a different perspective that when you describe a character, when you when you explain what they feel, when you put words in their mouth, you capture something of the present that you can't even capture when you talk about your own life. And so I think that in that regard, the the her ambition as a as a novelist was to always get closer to what life is and to take seriously life as a as a philosophical object. Yeah, this goes really nicely to, in, in your biography, Kate, you cite her works, The Ethics of Ambiguity, and I think this captures exactly what you just said, Manon. She writes, as long as there have been men who live, they have experienced the tragic ambiguity of their condition, and as long as there have been philosophers who think, most of them have tried to mask it. 
And Kate, you write, what was needed was an ethics that looked at the ambiguity of human life in the face instead of giving people alibis. Yeah, that's, I think that's about right. I think, and I, I was thinking about this too, Manon, in relation to your work, because I think one way to capture the messiness and entanglements of daily life is a point that you raise um, for you is the kind of most important and most taboo point that she brings up, de Beauvoir brings up in the second volume of The Second Sex, which is that um, there's something pleasant for women in submission. And that struck me as incredibly you know, messy, complex, ambiguous. Can you talk about this point and also how it was received? I imagine you know, you said that you went, you, this book was very successful. You went on tour. You were speaking to a lot of female readers. How was this point received in, to contemporary audiences? So it's funny because I actually didn't get any pushback. <laughs> People agreed with me. I mean, any, any woman knows that sometimes she takes pleasure in ironing a shirt, in cooking a nice meal, and that there's something about the pleasure that is taken there that feels like a bit wrong, but a bit right at the same time. And that there's a whole pleasure in objectification, a, a, a pleasure in, yeah, in self-objectification, in being pretty, in accompanying your partner if you're in a, um, a straight relationship at a, a, I don't know, at a dinner and feeling like he shows you off. And, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of women, if not all women, have experienced that at some point. And, um, and that, that I think is part of the problem. And, and this is, of course, the messiness. But I think what is interesting is that we're at a time where we can be, we can touch messier topics as feminists because the feminists before us did a big part of the work and that probably in the 70s, it was hard to just raise the question of what part do women play in their um, subordination because we needed to first see the part that men play. And, and it's crazy when you look at very serious anthropologists who say, well, the dominated, it's not the problem of people who dominate them, it's just that they like domination so much. And so when you wanna take seriously what happens to the dominated, you need to travel on a very dangerous line of taking seriously the messiness without falling into the trap of sexism and and uh, the hypothesis of self-conscious of um, false consciousness etc but i think what is wonderful with the second sex is that it helps us think through or or to say the the french way it helps us think problems because fr the Fr the french language allows for a transitive use of think that we've talked about with kate that i think is very important and so penser quelque chose and so really the the second sex helps us continue to think the situation of women even as it evolves and i think it's interesting in the context that you were raising of Beauvoir being a white feminist, uh, a white feminist, a bourgeois feminist, etc. There are ways in which Beauvoir didn't go far enough, that Beauvoir was not intersectional enough, etc. But when you read, for instance, Gender Trouble by Judith Butler, her, the entire thesis of Judith Butler is just that she's finishing the work of Beauvoir. And, and in a way, Beauvoir was a very important inspiration for philosophy of race. In a way, you can read The Second Sex today as being really trans-inclusive. You can read The Second Sex as setting the path for feminism for the 21st century. And, and I think in France especially, she's been weaponized by a certain fringe of supposedly universalist feminists to bring a sort of anti-Muslim agenda, anti-trans, anti-everything. Anti but that's really not what she's doing, I feel like. 
Kate, would you like to add, I'm thinking about the theme, the promised theme of this talk, contemporary feminism. How for you did de Beauvoir anticipate feminism that came next and how does she help us diagnose problems today? Well, so one of the things that I think is uh, interesting is that the text itself is vague enough that many positions are read into it. Um, and you could see that as a defect. If you were a certain sort of philosopher, you, you, you would. You think this is vagueness leaves ambiguity which can be exploited and so you find people on both sides of multiple questions invoking Beauvoir as a, as a sort of authority figure um, and but, but but one of the things that I really admire about her is that she was a, committed to the idea that no argument to authority should be persuasive and I think that there's a reason that she wrote the text in the way that she did which was to provoke her readers to think for themselves um, and the, so I, th I think her own theory of, of values, of, of how values come into being as an existentialist was that each human being brings values into being by valuing. And I think that her message to women would be, you are going to be confronted with a plethora of things that people tell you, you must value qua this or qua that as a woman or as a black person or you fill in whichever category you think involves a certain set of value commitments. And I think Beauvoir's message is, there will always be a multiplicity of incompatible myths. You decide for yourself. And so I think th this is one of the reasons I find Beauvoirian feminism inspiring, uh, because instead of getting a kind of dogmatic ideology, you get an invitation to think um, and to become who you are in your own situation. Okay, a final question for each of you. Since you both spent 10 years, you said 10 years on your thesis, uh, about 10 years on the, on the biography, what was the moment that she first spoke to you personally or that you had that kind of, you know, the experience that your, your students are having where they say, oh, I'm reading this and I feel that she's... I'm going to have an many. extremely French response. Uh, I read her diaries at school when I was 12, uh, <laughs> which, which in an American context would be unimaginable but I read the memoirs of a beautiful daughter at 12 and it was mind-blowing for me then um, and I reread re it at 18 and I still felt that it was mind-blowing so I think then what, it, what it's specifically I mean the whole thing there must have been specific moments or anecdotes or descriptions I really liked how she tried to capture happiness, um, and and I was, and and how and and that kind of links what I was saying about time is that in the memoirs of a beautiful daughter, she's trying to exp oh, to show her pleasure to be alive as a kid and as a young uh, as a beautiful daughter, and. She kind of fails, but she still tries. And to describe happiness and to describe the sort of energy that happiness is and um, and how it made her curious of so many things. And and yeah, I, I re really remember this as being really invigorating and exhilarating. And, and, and I, think, I think that's something that the French have completely forgotten and she says one thing about me is that I'm very gifted for happiness and I think that's true and that's something that is very beautiful about her that she really loved life and she tried to do philosophy through this love of life yes okay so it's interesting that neither of us uh, for neither of us it was the second sex um, f for me, it was um, her book on old age. Actually, I was I had just had my second child. You were also twelve years old. <laughs> no, I no, I was not twelve years old. I was considerably older. I was writing my doctorate on being in nothingness, uh, and I had just had my second child. And so I read a lot when I was breastfeeding, and I decided to read that book. Um, and it was fascinating because the analysis of uh, the marginalization of the elderly really resounded with me as a person who had just had a child. Um, because women are often excluded from many aspects of social life in the period of uh, new motherhood. 
And, but this love of life that you mentioned actually is one of the resounding features of that book for me, because there's, there's, a, there's a line in it when she says, um, you know, what must society be? And I, I can't remember it verbatim, but what must society be so that um, uh, the, the, the elderly are valued? And it, 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 she says that what, it has to be a society where we value everything that is human, because all stages of life are human. Childhood is human. Uh, maturity is human. Decline and death are human. And uh, th th there's, I, I think she just brings out this kind of, you know, if we don't value the laugh of a child or the pleasure of an old man drinking a glass of wine, then what kind of world are we making? And I think there's there's something really beautiful in that. Thank you. Can we have a big round of applause, please? Thank you so much. We have about 15 minutes for audience questions. And there are some. So Emily is going to run after doing a lap of the room. Getting my stuff, so. It was marvelous. <laughs> you know, what Connie and I are such fans of both of you. Um, one of my favorite chapters in, in The Second Sex is her analysis of uh, the five authors that she uh, grades, uh, Monterland, uh, D.H. Lawrence, Claudel, Breton, and Stendhal. I just love that chapter. Who's doing anything like that today? That kind of philosophical feminist criticism, which I still find so fantastic. Well, I don't know, but I don't know if one could be as mean today as she into Monterland. <laughs> and for, for those of you who, who don't know, Sheila and Connie are the translators of The Second Sex into English. And uh, they made it possible that we have now access to the whole book in English, which was extremely important because for me, because I read the text in, in French, so you, you may not know, but... The Second Sex was translated into English by a biologist called Parsley, who, sorry? Oh, so, oh, yeah. Well, who decided, A, that he would cut the passages he didn't find interesting um, without saying, so it's, it's written nowhere that it's an abridged version, and that he would correct the things that he disagreed with about biology especially. And so for me, since I had only read The Second Sex in, in French, I was so puzzled reading the secondary literature. I was like, these women, like, I don't know how they see Beauvoir saying this and that. Like, she's absolutely not saying this. And it turned out when we had the, the um, translation by um, Sheila and Connie, that it was just that he cut so many passages and he changed the text uh, a lot. Um, but who's doing that? I don't know. Like um, Alice Zeniter, she does something like that. Well, sh she's not really doing literary critique, but she yeah, I don't know. Who's doing that? I don't know either because I'm so much working in philosophy uh, that I don't sort of follow feminist literary cri criticism, but maybe other people in the room have comments on this. But I think I I'm going to be talk billion about this, but I think only the French can write with such wit and meanness about certain things that if it were when, you know, when Toril Moy writes about literature and she's nicer and, and there's something really of her time and of her country in the way that Beauvoir writes about the authors she doesn't like. Like I, you really, when you read this chapter, you really... I'm really happy I was not Monterland because uh, I would not have well, slept. To be fair, the the anti-feminist the anti-feminist tetralogy, the Les Jeunes Filles that she was criticizing, was a terrible piece of incredibly influential literature. So I think there are times when all the claws need to come out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was fascinating. And um, I was thinking throughout, um, I just finished reading uh, Metaphysical Animals, um, which is a book about women in Oxford in the same sort of as World War II and just afterwards, Iris Murdoch um, and her circle of friends doing philosophy, doing a kind of philosophy that was uh, 
also extremely sort of disrespected and, and denigrated academically and has kind of is just sort of coming back into you know there, there's work being done on them and I was just fascinated when you were talking in your discussion about genius and one of the things that's so powerful about that book is showing how the friendship of the women is just absolutely central to the way that their ideas develop and that there's no one of the reason they get sort of left out of the story is because they refuse to let go of this kind of human connection and interaction um you know that that really kind of um that strengthens their thinking, but also that counteracts like this isolationist sort of myth of a genius. And I, I wonder if you have thoughts about, I'm, I, I'm not sure how that, you know, whether there are resonances in, in Beauvoir's work with like other people she was in dialogue with, with specifically with women. And I feel like that's less part of her story, but uh, you know, that just it was, you know, same time period. I was just so struck by those kinds of, um, echoes sorry so i think that there's this there's really interesting work to be done here comparing beauvoir's ethics to the work of especially the kind of the work of i'd say more foot and uh yeah less so with anscombe and and murdoch because of their metaphysical commitments but in but the um with these, this generation of women philosophers in Oxford uh, during during the war, they were very preoccupied with how we could make meaningful ethical judgments. Because after uh, Nazism, after the Second World War, it, it no longer seemed acceptable to just ascribe to the dominant philosophy. So in Oxford at the time, people talked about emotivism, which is the idea that when you make a moral judgment that something is right or wrong, really all you're doing is saying boo or hurrah that's all it is it doesn't co there's no moral fact that makes genocide wrong it's just boo genocide um, and so this generation of philosophers in oxford thought that was an inadequate philosophical position and i think that we find in beauvoir a similar conviction that we need to be able to make moral judgments we need to be able to say that some things are evil such as the oppression of women um, and so th there's, there's, I think there's some very fascinating things that could be done looking into the ways that they approach that. In terms of friendships with women, it's a little trickier. She liked men. <laughs> you may disagree. No, but. no, I agree 100%. I think friendship had a very important role in her life, but friendship was Sartre. <laughs> and um, that's the thesis of Kate. Um, but I think also, I don't know. My problem was Metaphysical Animals and the other book about the Oxford Quatuor is that you would never have a book about Raymond Aron, Merleau-Ponty, and Sartre, and how they were friends and how it shaped their views. Because it's women who love each other and it shapes their ideas. And, and of course, like, these four women, they were at Oxford at the same time, and and some of some of them were very close friends, less uh, some less so. But I think it's also that suddenly the men were gone, and they were allowed to have a table, uh, a voice, and and there were and that there was a very big thing going on with the Second World War, and and that way. I don't know if gender matters so much, except for the fact that women were not sent to war. And so it's more a situation of being without the men, and so having the space to do things without the men, and also having a relationship to war intellectually that was not, am I going to be sent there or not? But what is there to think about the war? Um, and And so, I mean, I, I, it made me very interested, at, like this book, I, I, I loved it and I found it very interesting for, for many reasons, but I still think it's interesting to think about whose friendships we think about. And, and I think it's, it's, um, it's in your book that you talk about the Raymond Aron thing. I think that's, that's a very good thing. We, so Sartre and Aron were very good friends, 
And Aaron later on said, the minute he met Beauvoir, he thought she was so much smarter than me that he was not interested in talking with me anymore. And, and, but we don't talk about this so much. Well, Kate does, but, um, and, and so that's, that's also an important question. Whose friendships? Which kinds of friendships? Why do we think that the friendships between women are special? but the friendships among men and women are differently special. And I think the friendship between Beauvoir and Merleau-Ponty was extremely important as well for her thought and his. I agree. I'm just trying to think of counter examples, you know, to play devil's advocate. Um, and I, I think about, La of Boise. course, of course. <laughs> uh, but also if you look at someone like Rimbaud and, and Verlaine, I mean, they were lovers as well as intellectually inspiring to each other. Uh, so I think we can allow for that in the case of some men um, but I, I, I agree with you that the that this kind of relational approach to women's intellectual development is asymmetrical when we look at the way men are depicted. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering um, when you talk about these like evils of myth of women or. Um, how you would differentiate the evils of these myths of women when it comes to the responsibility to portray feminism now in fiction and um, intersectionality. With Do you have particular myths in mind? Um, well, you were talking about like submissiveness and um, what was the other one that you mentioned? You said, um, yeah, the myth, the myth, mostly the myth of submissiveness and this idea of messiness and how that plays into representation now with um, trying to be intersectional in a way that is maybe outside of gender. So for me, what was interesting. Um, about the prism of submissiveness is that it allowed me to understand a lot about racism in America. Because a lot of the racism that African American women face, or the, the intersectional oppression of um, sexism and racism, is that they're not submissive enough. And they're, it's, and so all the myth of the angry, uh, black women of the like they're seen as not polite in the right way not not waspy the right way but what we call being was waspy and not being angry is just the submissiveness of um, wasp Americans and on the other hand the racism that Asian American women are facing is this sort of sexualization of their supposed complete submissiveness that makes them they're good women you know you can count on them because they're perfectly submissive but they're actually so so it's like there are two flips of the same coin they're actually good women because they're perfectly submissive but then they're also judged for being too submissive or not submissive enough so you you see that and then you have working class women that are not that are too busy to be submissive the right way. And, and all the, the sort of desperate housewives or, or real housewives, et cetera, it's all about proposing a white bourgeois um, feminine submissiveness that, that structures the social world. And I think we see it with the trad wives movement and, and all these, uh, and also all, all this movement now, even outside of the right wing of the, um, uh, you know, tech people who went to uh, live in the Midwest or, or in the, the wilderness to raise their families was just uh, the guy who works on the internet, but the wife, she found out that she loves making homemade butter. And you know, like uh, she loves, uh, you know, cleaning the diapers by hand and all of this. And, and you know, they are self-sufficient and they reconnected to nature. And there's all this sort of narrative of a sort of white bourgeois submissiveness. So I, I, I actually think 
this is a myth that allows us to question um and and as i said about france like it, it's really also a myth that allows us to think about the problem of post colonial france and and the racism in the country etc so I, i'm i'm hoping that it's useful could i say one thing on that as well so i, th I think it's interesting to look at the um social dominance penalties so when Psychologists have demonstrated that people have uh, different kind of levels of toleration for or appreciation of hierarchy. And it, these kinds of forms of submission inv involve complying with a particular conception of hierarchy, uh, whether it's uh, Asian women or black women. And the punishments, the, the penalties that people experience um, uh, for stepping out of line uh, with, the, with what is expected of them, I think is one, one way that we could help represent submission and its consequences. Um, in particular, uh, the the reasons why you might take pleasure in submission, because it's not necessarily a positive pleasure. It can also be a negative one, that you are avoiding penalties, which would otherwise be painful. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a good question to think about. We have one final question on Zoom. We'll turn to our, our Zoom audience, which has been sitting patiently waiting for us. Um, <laughs> Damaris is asking on the theme of contemporary feminism for these last couple of minutes, if there are any particular contemporary feminist writers or philosophers that you guys are finding exciting that you would like to spotlight um, for this audience or whose work you'd like to talk about. I mean, I really like Kate Kirkpatrick, um, <laughs> but so um, <laughs> apart from that, um, I really like, um, I don't know, Kate Mann, Amia Srinivasan. Um, we work a lot with Filipa Melo Lopez, but she mostly publishes um, uh, academic things. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the same list. I mean, we talk about these things uh, independently, but I think I'm, I'm especially interested in uh, feminists who are thinking about uh, desire and also on things, the questions that I've mentioned about motherhood as well. So Jacqueline Rose, I think is a really interesting person to read.